Welcome back to another episode of Off Hours with Bourbon Lens. This is Jake, along with Jake, who is also an interviewee in this podcast episode. So, Jake, you know, just just let the conversation come to you, as you always do. But we're also joined by other brand founders uh, in the alcohol and beverage category. Today, we are joined by Taylor Steele of Solenta Tequila, Lauren Winata of Malati, a non-alcoholic beverage, and Doug Campbell of 8 Beer. Thanks, guys, for joining this episode of Off Hours with Bourbon Lens. You Thank you. Happy <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Not everybody at once. And of course. Everybody, everybody. Hey. Once and then everybody. Yeah, I will. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to conduct over here as, as we go through. So love panel discussions. These are great. Um, and, you know, excited to lean into the beverage alcohol, you know, conversation today. And all of you all have created craft brands that are, are coming to market and doing different things. So I would be remiss if I didn't allow you all the first few minutes to give your elevator pitch to what you're doing and who you all are from a brand perspective. So I'm from the South. So we do ladies first. So Lauren, uh, would you like to you know first start off here? Absolutely. Thank you for that introduction. At Malati Drinks, we make a luxury non-alcoholic spirit. So it's an alcohol alternative that's inspired by traditional tonic drink remedies from Asia that we've used, you know, since 1293. And so we're sourcing these exact same ingredients. We're doing a cold extraction process, and then we're blending 20 to 25 ingredients per bottle to make a fine spirit just without the alcohol or sugar or calories or hangover. <laughs> well, I think every uh, fitness nerd who listens to this podcast just perked up a little bit and was like, oh, hey, there's an alternative to this. So you said 1293. So I'm going to press into that for a second. That's a long, long time ago. Um, so, you know, how do you just, how do you resurrect something like that to bring those remedies forward? Yeah. So um, these remedies and these drinks have been passed through generation to generation. It's still drunk to this day. And, you know, before we used paper, we used palm leaves. So we wrote palm leaf manuscripts on the leaves of the palm tree. And uh, you can still find these recipes written today in, in Southeast Asia or in Indonesia, where I'm from. And basically, a little history lesson, back in 1293, the whole of Southeast Asia, so if you think of Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, yeah, we could go on, um, was one Majapahit empire. And so it was, it was all united as one empire. And that's why you see a lot of similar ingredients, um, which had traveled through the region via spice trade. And so a lot of that we are bringing to the world today. That's exciting. And we'll, we'll continue to press into that because I'm a history nerd. I was going to be a history teacher at one point uh, in my, my life before I was like, mm, teachers don't make a lot of money in America. Um, and you know, while there is fulfillment with that, and I, I love all the teachers, if I ran for president, first thing I would do is give teachers a raise. But I, I couldn't do that for myself. I wanted to, to do other things. Um, so Awesome, Lauren. Excited to meet you uh, and excited to have this conversation uh, along, along with the guys. You're going to bring us a lot of knowledge that these men don't have. So uh, next, Taylor, I'm going to go to you because you're world world traveler as well and, and actually have some connection from uh, where you lived at one point in your life, uh, wh where Lauren is from originally. So you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, Taylor. Yeah. Uh, my background is uh, I grew up in San Diego. I'm a filmmaker and I made surf films for a long time. And then um, I pivoted from that to making documentaries as a whole. And I worked it with National Geographic, doing some of their documentaries and um, I still do some uh, to this day. And and then um, uh, as a as a director of film, you sort of need to do other things that pay the bills. And commercials were that that element for me. And I started working in the commercial space. And I, I did a lot of stuff for Corona, Pacifico, Apple, and Samsung, and then a whole bunch of other brands. And as as a as a film director, you sort of improve your skill set and you get better and better at selling the product. But for me, the, the, that whole thing became a moral dilemma of what I was selling compared to um, being a better filmmaker. And so it, it, it caused me to really analyze what commercials I was working on. And I was sort of filtering that so much that I just decided to create my own brand with all the pillars that I believed in. And, you know, the, the main thing is it's less about, myself and and my involvement in the brand and and who's behind it and more about how people are interacting with it 
and being more present and connecting with loved ones. And, 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 and to do that, you want an, uh, something of high quality and, and something that's, that's uh, got no additives and, and is made right. So we, I use those pillars to sort of like guide myself through the whole journey of creating a brand that, that was just done right all the way from, from beginning to end. Um, packaging, a lot of consideration with packaging, uh, the, the whole tequila processing uh, done without shortcuts. Um, as I dove into this world, I really learned that a lot of like the more high percentage, like 90%, maybe even more, um, are, are done with shortcuts and additives and uh, blue agave sweeteners added to it. So mm. as I learned that, I really started, uh, got some momentum and really um, ran with uh, just never doing shortcuts with it. Mm. And so landed with Slento tequila. Yeah. And tequila is hot, uh, right? And so it's, it's really interesting. Um, I was mentioning this before the podcast to create a non-additive tequila. You'd be surprised if you do enough research on your favorite tequila brand there's probably some additives. Um, so, you know, creating a brand with honor um, and with integrity is is really important. And so I, I appreciate, you know, that mission and what you're creating there with Salento. Uh, and so last but not least, uh, Doug, uh, in the great state of Texas, everything's not bigger in Texas, everybody. <laughs> Just want to let y'all know that. Um, but you all, you all are creating, creating beer down in Texas. So tell us a little bit about eight. We are indeed. And Taylor, funny, I was chuckling as you were talking because we uh, have very much the same ethos in the world of beer, uh, as you just mentioned. And I'll give the, the parallel in a second. But no, I so uh, nice to meet you all. Doug Campbell from 8 Beer based out of Austin. 8 is about years, a year old. Um, it is a light lager. So similar to other brands you would buy that are under 100 calories, for example. Um, but uh, what's different about 8 is that uh, it is made without actually literally it says no shortcuts uh, on the can because most light loggers we we basically flip the traditional approach on its head. Most light loggers start with something that people say, "I like this. I would just like fewer calories." And what the brewer will do was remove parts out of that drink essentially, and in our point of view, it removes a lot of the goodness out of it. So we started from scratch and said we would like a light beer, not a light beer, if that makes any sense, what I just said. Um, <laughs> but we want it to be made from the same kind of quality ingredients that a, a, the type of drinker who goes through the store and looks for organic produce, grass-fed meats, etc. When they get to the beer category, they shouldn't be forced to compromise. Uh, and that is the the spirit with which we built eight. Uh, so we've been in the market now about a year. Uh, we're doing pretty well so far. Uh, but as you guys all know, entrepreneurship is hard. Plenty of hard road ahead, but uh, it's been a really fun first year. He did quit, like not mention one of the facts that uh, he's got a little bit of help with a guy who's on ESPN on Mondays in the fall named Troy. That is part of the the leadership team there and ownership group. So you know that 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 can't hurt, especially being in Texas. No, that is correct. No, it does, you're right. My one of my co-founders, there are four of us, uh, is NFL legend Troy Aikman, and he's been and we built the brand. Uh, a lot around his, and I would say all of our ethos of no shortcuts, no excuses is what it says on the can. Uh, and Troy has uh, been, uh, you know, a hard driver on this from the very beginning mm. and very involved. Um, he's been a light beer drinker for a long time. If you look on the internet, you'll see some promotional work he did many years, moons ago. So he comes by the category and comes by the the drinkership, honestly. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And before I go to Jake, because we all know Jake's story about, about, by now about off hours, but you, you will get some shine here in a second, but it is a perfect time to upset the apple cart in the light beer category with everything that has happened. Uh, we will not go into specifics, but you know, light beer is at a, a pivotal point um, where the traditional American lager is under attack a little bit. And you've seen a little bit of a, a play by other brands like imports to go pick up the, the Miller light, the, you know, Bud light, Corona, you know, the Corona and Pacifico, as you mentioned, you know, Taylor earlier, like working with them, like they're trying to take that ploy or Modelo coming in with a, a, a newer, you know, like lighter, lighter beer. Um, so I, I think what you said, and I think the whiskey drinkers will understand what you said about the light, the non light, light beer, um, because taking away those things does make it, make it that way. And the easiest way to do that in bourbon, add water, right? So um, same thing yeah. with the process that you're doing. 
Very similar. And I, the, 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 the parallel for Taylor is the, 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 the additive version in beer, they're called adjuncts. Mm. Um, and you basically use cheaper grains, which for those of you who know the brewing process or the mash process, they ferment more cleanly uh, and they ferment more cheaply, most importantly. But they also are flavorless. They're purchased for that very purpose. Mm-hmm. So eight, unlike those, is a all is an all malt beer made from 100% organic barley and all barley. We don't have any sugars or syrups or corn or any of the stuff that, that others use as fillers. Because again, we're trying to deliver real beer flavor with oh my gosh, it's only 100 calories, or, or actually in our case, 90. There you go. Even better. We can really count cows. Yeah. At that point. So instead of my one IPA, I could drink three eights. That's about <laughs> right. Uh, if I did the math, I think a normal IPA is like yeah. 270 calories. Yeah. yeah, you're about right. So if, you, if you've if you been living under a tree, uh, I'll introduce our next guest here, and been listening to the podcast and not picked up on what Jake does, well, here you go. Jake, you know, here's an opportunity to tell a little bit more about Off Hours since we haven't talked about it enough this season. Yeah, well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, Off Hours is something I've been working on since um, like early 2018 when I started to build the brand. And uh, we launched in October of 2020. So right in the thick of COVID, which uh, made things really interesting. But, um, you know, the whole ethos of the brand, you know, is really similar to, to you know, the rest of us on this, this podcast where I feel like we could all been in the room together and just chose different categories to go into from beer and non-alc and, and tequila, but to bourbon and really trying to create a brand that, um, you know, was a little bit less about some of the, you know, some of the stereotypes or some of the uh, preconceived notions about bourbon and who a bourbon drinker is and making it a little bit more relatable, um, you know, less intimidating to customers who aren't your diehard, uh, you know, bourbon connoisseurs. So, um, yeah, the goal was to, to create something that was a little bit more modern, so less about family heritage, less about where we source our grains and our water and all that stuff. And, and just really trying to get it, um, you know, to, to create something that people are able to, um, you know, enjoy and, and think about it in, in ways that, um, you know, hasn't been kind of done or repeated over and over and over again uh, in the bourbon industry. So, um, yeah, we we started in Indiana and Kentucky and uh, sort of the Los Angeles area and now expanded um, into several other states. And we just opened up uh, Illinois as well as our most recent. Um, So we'll start there. And we've got um, our one main product and then we've got a single barrel product. And then we've got a a few others that are in the pipeline that, um, you know, should be out in the next year or so. Yeah. And it's, it's very exciting. I get to uh, get to work with Jake and his team, Chloe behind the scenes a lot. And so I know, I know him pretty well. And, and I think you all should, should give, you know, off hours a try. I'm not just saying that because we we've done a whole podcast series with them. I'm just, I really think so. We did a single barrels, a lot of fun, tastes good. Uh, and I enjoy it. So thank you all for introducing yourselves. Uh, that is, that is the first part of the podcast. Now into the heavy hitting journalism. That is the bourbon lens. It's really not. But one of the things, you know, I, I like to, to start off with, you all are all entrepreneurs um, and you're entering a very crowded space. There is a lot of shelf space. Uh, there's not a lot of shelf space. You got to force your way onto it. So, um, you know, Taylor, I'll start with you because I feel like there's a, a celebrity tequila every second. I blink and there's a new celebrity having a tequila. You know, what's that like and how scary is that to approach, you know, this category that's booming? Alcohol, be- uh, beverage alcohol is is exploding across the world. Um, what's it like to try to enter that space with so much money being pumped into it from celebrities to, um, you know, legends or, you know, brands that have been doing it for centuries? Yeah. You know, I, I, st- I started working on this project, you know, re- really um, in 2016 and just sort of really um, vetting out the different sort of thought processes on, you know, even entering the alcohol space. And, you know, there's a lot of negatives uh, connotations with that of, uh, and so I wanted to make sure it was a positive uh, effect and and having it sort of change the perception of the way people drink. And, you know, like there's a sort of uh, at times maybe a macho approach or like, um, you know, there's just um, or a FOMO sort of mentality to to the way alcohol has been used. And so I wanted to sort of change that and, and, and have it as a way for people to connect. So as I started finding my own lane in that space. I got more confidence and started working down that road. Um, during that time, there wasn't, you know, many tequilas that and and uh, that had any other sort of messaging besides their process of how it's being made. And so, 
for me, that felt like a, a, a creative storytelling way to sort of not go deep into the actual process, but how it interacts with you and 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 treat it more of like a lifestyle brand for lack of a better way to describe it. Mm. Um, come, we launched early 2020 during COVID, which is, you know, maybe an opportunity as well to sort of skip some of the more traditional ways of launching alcohol brands where you have to go to on-premise and then then to off-premise. And, and so there, there's opportunities with that. But at that same time, there was a lot of celebrity brands that launched and it, it really flooded the market. And so the way I look at it is, is, you know, intention will come back into play with consumers. It, and if they feel the intention of the brand is correct, that'll win in the long run. So we might have to weather a little bit of a storm of a flood of market, but we'll ride that out. And it has affected us, but we're, we're, we're getting wins by relationships, by, by just coming out with real authentic reason for being here. Yeah. And you said something really interesting that approaching more as a lifestyle brand versus, you know, traditional beverage alcohol. I know Jake, when you all first launched off hours, you all, uh, rolled it out to a lot of people that were into lifestyle. You didn't go to the bourbon podcasters or like the, the traditional bourbon route. So when you think about the similarities there, did you all see that same entry to market opportunity to approach a different type of consumer through lifestyle conversations? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, when we started kicking around the idea of, of what our target market was going to look like, our target demographic, it was, you know, who, who do you, who comes to mind, you know, as a bourbon drinker? And it's like, well, typically who comes to mind versus who is actually doing the majority of the bourbon drinking are two totally different people. Um, so that's where we started to just look at the numbers and it was like, well, why are, why is no one focusing on, you know, a little bit younger demographic? Why is no one focusing on females or other, um, you know, backgrounds or ethnicities or anything like that? And it's just sort of like, you know, it felt like that was our, our opportunity to get our foot in. And I think that, you know, with social media and Instagram and, and just a lot of the other avenues that, you know, we were kind of forced to take, like Taylor said, like, you know, bars and restaurants weren't open. So, you know, you couldn't go in there and get your bottle on the back bar, get it on the cocktail menu. Um, you know, it was delivery, like Drizzly blew up, GoPuff blew up, you know, all these other, um, you know, the cocktail delivery aspect of it from restaurants was one thing. So it was, um, it was something that sort of forced us to get into that younger demographic even more. And that's what like, you know, that younger demographic is on social media. They are using apps. They are, you know, getting things delivered to their front door, whether it's groceries or, you know, dinner or whatever it be. So it kind of played right into what we wanted to do anyways. And, and it, you know, it's, it's something that now as things have kind of gotten back to normal, um, you know, we still really heavily rely on, on those strategies. Um, even though now you got to go to the restaurant or now you can go to the liquor store and, and do a tasting or something like that. But, uh, it's something that we, you know, built the foundation of the brand off of. Mm. No, I think that's really interesting. And, and this, this leads me into uh, a question for Doug, you know, off of that, you talked about like the average consumer, um, you know, being someone you prototypically have in your head, um, right. For the bourbon person, you think of grandpa, like with his bourbon and a cigar or a business, guy in a business suit drinking his whiskey, whether it's bourbon or scotch. Um, you know, the traditional light beer drinker is Joe Frat Boy, um, you know, pounding six at a, a tailgate. Um, and so you, you know, you mentioned in your in your introduction a little bit about, you know, attacking or not attacking, attracting the organic drinker, the, um, the person who's thinking holistically about their body and what they're putting into it. So what's it like to try to, you know, change a whole market demographic that has been so heavily thought of one way? Well, it's a really interesting question. I mean, eight is made for those who care about, as Troy would say, everything they put in their body and, and as they chase their purpose, whatever that happens to be, right. Uh, we are the beer for the person who is going to work their ass off all day long, want to take a break at the end of the day, but don't want to ruin themselves for the next morning. Cause you know, you're going to get up and start it all over again. Um, and as we surveyed the category, we saw a pretty fundamental misfit between like just what you were just saying in terms of what, the lighter beer world was built for largely 20 years ago, 30 years ago, these brands were built as sort of reduced versions of something that was already out there and beloved by beer drinkers. Um, 
And so our approach, and the, and we really try to focus in on folks that we call early risers, you know, hardest worker in the room, whatever you know um, vernacular you want to use for that that type of person. You can all picture one in your head, um, and build a brand around them. And from everything, every ingredient we put in the product to Actually, our marketing, which, as you guys all know, as startups, is not a high highfalutin media plan with television. Uh, most of our marketing is getting out and meeting other people who are of the same persuasion and saying, hey, here's a beer that was built uh, with you in mind. Here's what it, what's in it. Um, let us know if you like it. And trying to do as much grassroots, sort of as we say in the beer industry, cans and hands uh, as you can, um, because that's ultimately... We believe we have a proposition that will appeal to that mindset. And if they do too, uh, they'll spread the word for us. That's sort of the only approach as a startup. Even I say that with somebody who's well known as a founder, um, you know, that's that only gets you so far. The, the 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 product still has to be built, has to be purpose built for a certain type of consumer. Uh yes, the there are a lot more people who drink light beer than those who go running every now and then or whatever it is, but if we don't get the first, we'll never get the second. Mm. No, I think that makes a, makes a ton of sense um, because you ha- you have to be you have to replicate POs, right? Like you have to get someone to enjoy the spirit once, and then it could be their go to from that on then on out. Yeah. Um, and you know, we talk about the early risers uh, in that one of the things that has become popular is, is non-alcoholic bars or, you know, beverages in that way. So Lauren, I'll come to you on, on this. Like you th- we talk about, you know, these different demographics in these pods, like how are you all capitalizing on this movement of a cleaner mind, a cleaner thought process? You know, where have you all seen the opportunity to kind of dive in for, for your all's brand? I think where we really look Firstly, are people who enjoy quality, like many of the other folks on this po- uh, podcast right now. And, you know, while you want to think of maybe the person who's drinking a bit less or not drinking as that person who is that, you know, hardest worker in the room or the number one early riser, of course, that that is part of the people. But at the end of the day, tell me one person that doesn't want to be just a bit healthier or doesn't want to just drink a bit less. And I think because it's such a new and nascent category, we're just seeing people who are open to trying it out and trying new flavors um, kind of be that uh, demographic. It's still very new as a industry, um, but where we want to sit in that industry. and, And I'm sure I'm sure everyone here knows about, you know, the non-alk beers that have been around since our parents and our grandparents' time, the non-alk wines, you know, that have been around since those times. I think kind of what non-alk 2.0 is that we're going through now is people are like, oh, I don't want a sad version of, you know, this already not great beer that I don't like. Or, (laughs) you know, we want something that actually is satisfying, that's flavorful, that pairs well with food. And that's actually, you know, good for you. And that's hard to find because a lot of the alcohol alternatives are copies. They're a non-alcoholic gin or a non-alcoholic vodka. I don't know why that one exists. But, you know, (laughs) and then people are trying to make up the mouthfeel with sugar. With A lot of them are made by flavor houses. You'll see, you know, flavors on there. They add coloring to make it, oh, bright like a Campari or, you know, something that's to hit more of your sensory notes. But instead, you know, we've gone a a different way where we want to make something so premium with the same craftsmanship, heritage, and fine ingredients as a premium craft spirit. And so we're searching for how do we add more flavor? How do we add more mouth feel and texture naturally? How do we, you know, satisfy the chefs, sommeliers, and bartenders in the 30 Michelin-starred restaurants that were already listed on the menu at? How do we keep making these people happy, people who love food, who love flavor, and who don't want that, you know, sugar? And so how do you do that then without adding any sugar or adding any artificial colors or flavors or any of these things that we're so hardwired in our minds to love um, and to, you know, release dopamine for? So Instead, we're going low and slow with a kind of cold extraction process in water for six weeks. And with high pressure and low temperatures, you get all the oils out. It's similar to how you make perfume. 
So it's a very concentrated, really flavorful and also perfumed and like mouthfeel. It's thick. It's viscous. It's uh, yeah, that's that's the way we've gone. So hopefully it just satisfies anyone who's looking for a really tasty beverage. No, that, that definitely sounds interesting. And I will just make this disclaimer right here. While she said it's the same process as perfume, don't go drinking your perf- perfume bottle to see what type of flavors it has. That would just be a bad idea. This is not, we are not starting a TikTok challenge on eating Tide Pods here, uh, <laughs> listeners. Uh, so don't do it. This is my disclaimer. My my legal partner, <laughs> aka my, my editor, will make sure that we are safe in that department. We're all safe, guys. We're all safe. We did nothing wrong. <laughs> so you, you have talked about, you know, the way to get to the consumer a bunch. And, uh, you know, those have been guided questions. Uh, but one of the things that you all have, have done is be brave. And I think, uh, that is the American dream in a way is to be brave, to take a step out and take a risk. Right. So, um, from a founder's perspective, uh, going out and, you know, making sure you can replicate the PO, right. Like we were talking about Doug, like what was the biggest fear for you when starting, starting this, this business. And, uh, and Doug, I'll start with you. Cause we, we kind of hint, hinted at this when, when we, when you were answering your question. Yeah, I think, um, that's a great question. The biggest fear I suppose for, and, and for me, I'm a first time entrepreneur. I've worked around the, the beverage alcohol business for my, my whole career, but first time going out on my own. Um, I think the biggest fear is probably actually the what I do know more than the what I don't know in a weird way. And that I've been in this industry now for um, about 20 years. Uh, I've seen so many like ourselves come and go. Uh, And it's very easy, I think, to get wrapped up in the statistics of how many startups don't work out and all that kind of, and, you know, we're walking right into a buzzsaw in the most competitive category in the biggest category of beverage alcohol. Uh, And, you know, in the biggest, well, second biggest state. Um, so I suppose there is some fear of like, well, this is really in our case, jumping, you know, we're jumping headfirst into the deep end. Um, and at the same time, and again, I say this to somebody who has not been an entrepreneur before, that is also entirely the thrill. (laughs) Um, and if we're going to do this, then let's actually swing for the fences and go for it. But it has taken me time as somebody whose background is not as a, as a founder to wake up every day thinking, yeah, this could be the last May 4th uh, that this ever happened, right? Uh, um, and I think learning to live with that, and I, I do mean that, I mean, live with that and not be bound up by it and actually motivated by it, which I, I certainly am, is a very different mindset. And everybody on this panel has clearly found their own way to, to master that too. I found it to be quite a change, um, but one that I really enjoy. I, I, it would be hard to go back. Or at least if I were ever were to go back, I would take with it this experience um, with me and I would be better for it either way. Mm. What about you, Taylor? Like you're, you're also going into a, uh, an area that has, you know, brand power, right? Whether it's Casamigos or Terramana or whatever the hell Kevin Hart's tequila is, you know, right? You're going into like people have just gone into this spirit gung ho, you know, did that present a, a fear for you as you kind of went through this and, and created that lifestyle product that people could enjoy that has a purpose and a principle behind it? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that it's, it's, there's on, there's only so much shelf space. There's only so much, uh, you know, mind space that you could sort of try to steal from and get attention. Um, but, but for me, like, like just sort of thinking of, you know, I get inspired by people that that do something and then that that career sort of goes through its arc and then it's done and then they jump in and go again. Like I love that idea of having a beginner's mindset and being being willing to learn, being humbled, being failing and all these sort of experiences that are naturally going to happen. Um you know, I I rather choose to you know um go in with a little bit of that sort of we'll figure it out. Let's jump in the fire and go then, then sit on the sidelines and go, it's too busy. It's too crowded. Um, when I think about it, like filmmaking, probably more crowded than, than tequila. So, you know, if you could do it in, in another space, I think that mindset, if you, if you 
lower your ego could could work again. And so that's sort of my thought process with with all that. Yeah. No, I, I think that makes makes a ton of sense. And um, you know, Lauren, like you're you're going into a space that's unknown, right? Like Oduls has been around for centuries, like you talk about, right? Not centuries, but you know, for years. Um, and that's the one people want to avoid because they're like, oh, who wants Oduls? You know, for you, like in a, in an emerging category, what's that? Like, what fears do, did did you all have when creating this product and bringing these ancient recipes? Would America adopt them? Like, what are, what are those processes that you all were thinking through? You know, every day is a roller coaster of fear for me. And it's still on that. It's kind of when it's like, when does this end? Um, never. And so with uh, this, we actually launched Malati two years ago in Singapore, in the thick of COVID. And Singapore is where I was based. It's where, you know, my friends and my family are, Singapore and Indonesia. And so I've actually just moved alone to the U.S. this year to bring Malati to the U.S. market. And so when you talk about fear, talk wow. about, you know, this 20-something-year-old uh, girl just, like, coming to the U.S., not understanding anything about how the beverage industry here works and mm. thinking, okay, well, uh, yeah, I'm just going to bring this new product in a new category with new ingredients here, and, and you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, so I think... Uh, you know, there's this phrase that I really like, which is forever is composed of now. And, you know, I always fear about the future. I think, you know, a million miles ahead. And what if this or what if that? Um, I sell to one store, but that's not enough to make the revenue for the month that I need to hit, you know, <laughs> for this to be a successful business. Um, we launched in Singapore and, you know, we did pretty well over there to get into over 30 Michelin starred restaurants there and in Hong Kong. Um, and then the lockdown happened again. We went through a few lockdowns out there more than in the U S. Um, and then you're like, okay, well, we're kind of doing well, but on the world scale, Singapore, you were like 6 million people, you know, that's not even one state in America. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, everything is just about perspective and, uh, yeah. So it's just, I'm, I don't know if that answered your question, but kind of the mindset of how to deal with what feels like failure every day almost is just yeah. saying, okay, well, you know, doing the best that I can right now. Well, today. You, and you, you felt faced fear on, on a multitude of levels, like, right. Like leaving, leaving home to come to the States. Like it's crazy enough here. Uh, and, and then plus all the other stuff that's happened in Asia over the last several years yeah. from COVID, like that's gotta be, whoa. Okay. Yeah, looking for friends. Hit me up on Malati drinks. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, that's that's funny. Uh, didn't didn't they like try to do like a friend finder app or something at one point, and then it just went to hell in a handbasket real quick. Um, uh, so so Jake, you know, with this, like you entered the hottest brand or hardest hottest category in the world, bourbon, and like you were on the like 2016, 2017, like the precipice of the boom is starting to like really come on, you know, what did you think, uh, being from Indiana right near the, one of the largest whiskey producing facilities in the world, um, which was, has, is, is now Ross and Squibb distillery. Uh, you know, what was that like for you to like kind of come home to the spirit in a way, but also, um, uh, enter into a, a booming category? Yeah. It felt like I was able to kind of, um, bridge the gap between, growing up in the Midwest and living on the West coast now. So I felt like it was a good way to get me back to, you know, my roots and, you know, never forget them. And I think that, um, you know, working with them directly, it's like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of brands that, that work with, with MGP. Um, but I don't think any of them actually grew up, you know, down the road or had family that worked there, or, you know, that still worked there. Um, so I felt like I had that angle. Um, but at the same time, I felt like, you know, you didn't want to be just one of those brands that was sourcing barrels from them and, you know, just had a fancy label and, you know, felt like it was just a marketing scheme as far as just smoke and mirrors. So it was like, you know, I really want to create a product that that is different, but at the same time, you know, not so far different that it's going to get looked, uh, you know, looked at funny from, you know, the bourbon industry as a whole. Um, so I felt like one of the biggest fears because, you know, I don't, I don't have a co-founder or anything. And it was something that I, I kept talking to my wife about. It's like, I keep thinking about these ideas of launching this brand. And, and, you know, eventually she was like, are you going to do this or not? Like, and, and I think that 
the, my biggest fear was can constantly bouncing ideas off of people and, and thinking about like, am I thinking about this the right way? Like why, why has no one done this other stuff over here? How come, you know, have brands done it and they've just failed. And it's like, um, you know, so you kind of second guess yourself a little bit to like, you know, am I, should I be doing it this way? And, and, uh, you know, I think as you get into it and you start to get reactions and, and, you know, positive ones, you start to like, yeah, gain that confidence that like, okay, I am, you know, I am going about this right way. And I think that, you know, we got a small team, but, you know, we, we definitely take more of a collaborative approach for everybody, you know, on the team where, you know, we all, everybody's giving their input and, uh, you know, hopefully finding, uh, you know, ways to work together on everything. And then, you know, even stuff like this, where it's like getting, getting founders together, getting people with more experience together that you can, you know, just sort of, again, uh, get a better understanding of like what, what you've done, how you can utilize it and what not to do, I think is the best thing for us. And, and for me, it's just constantly feeling like you're trying to learn and, and, you know, hopefully you never make a big mistake, but it's like, um, you know, I think to Taylor's point, it was like, you're going to make, you're, like, you're going to fail, you're going to make mistakes and everything, but just don't let it be too detrimental. Mm, yeah. Fail fast. Right. And, and get back mm -hmm. up. There was a, I was, I was, I was listening to something last night. Um, and it was about this, the, the spare knuckle fighter, um, and who was the first bare knuckle fighter, um, in, in the, our last bare knuckle world champion. And then the first gloved world champion, his, his last fight was 61 rounds. And before he, he went through it, um, the, the, or at the end of the fight, you know, a reporter asked him like, how'd you do it? He goes, I lived by a motto. One more round when your arms are tired and you can't defend yourself, pick them up one more round. Like when you get punched in the face, one more round, like when you get knocked down one more round. And he's like, that's how he approached life. And I feel like that, like you all are, you take body blows all the time. Right. And like, you have to bounce back and you have to go one more round. And so as, as you pick yourself up and you see these wins, you know, what's been the most gratifying thing that you've seen just as you've, you've taken those punches and, and one, one more round. So Lauren, I'll start with you. Like what's been the, you know, as you've, you've taken all these challenges and, and things right in front of you, what's been that one more round that you've been, you know, glad that you bounced back out of the corner and, and showed up, you know, to keep bringing the dream alive uh, for Melody drinks. Yeah. So I think coming to America is actually, you know, the, the one more round we were in Singapore, you know, it, it was nice, but it wasn't a full business. It wasn't at the scale that I really wanted it to be. And so it was, it really kind of came to a point where, okay, you know, do we, do we kind of just like, let go of, do I let go of this business? I'm also a solo founder. So it was really, you know, do I go back to my previous job at venture capital where, you know, I had a good life <laughs> and, you know, I, the salary came in every month and, you know, it was comfortable. Otherwise now I'm like eating through my savings, you know, we're just, uh, you know, going into a new category that maybe the world isn't ready for, you know, that's always the worry where at the end of the day, alcohol, is addictive for a reason because it has alcohol and that's, that's nothing against it. You know, we all love a glass of wine. We all love that drink, but it's, you know, there's just like with sugar and just like with caffeine, there's something that makes people physically want to come back when there's no alcohol in a drink and you, then you remove the sugar and stuff, you know, how do you really get people to make this a habit, to make it a ritual, to be part of their daily lives? Um, and that's really a question where I came across and I'm still, you know, I still question till this day, you know, is this category going to make it? And I truly believe that there has been a shift in the way that we think in the lifestyles that we have, that we all want to be healthier. And it's just about how fast that shift is. We all know, you know, soda is probably not great for us. But then, you know, what's the actual shift to then, okay, well, then I'm not going to drink soda. I'm going to drink something better. You know, that's, that's really the question. What's, how long is that shift going to take? Yeah. No, I think that's, it's so important. I was literally talking to someone today at lunch. I was like, man, I need to give up sodas. Like I can get rid of them for like seven, eight months. And then like you, you have one and it's like, once it hits your lips, it just tastes so good. Um, at least it's, it's diet. Addictive. At least it's diet soda, you know, like zero calories. But, you know, what's aspartame going to do to my body, uh, you know, 20 years down the right. road? Uh, well, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out one way or the other. It, it, it'll either I, I, either I will live a full life because I had my diet soda or I will die a happy man. 
one of the <laughs> yeah. one or two yeah. things. Circle, circle back on on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll circle I'll, when 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 uh we're, when we're old older here in twenty years. I'll circle us back up and say the diet coke didn't kill me yet. So that's that's <laughs> that's, that's the hope at least. Um, for for Doug, like you know, y'all are are newer, one year into it. Like, what's been your all's like? You know, coming out of the corner and and your all's one more round. Well, I think for me with eight the one more round kind of moment and it happens every now and then is look, we're in a very competitive category, uh, in light beer. Um, and it's a, um, it's a competitive business and it's a complicated business, right? Um, I can remember starting out during the pandemic as we were doing formulation and watching all these DTC brands taking off and thinking, man, if only I could do that, that would be so easy to get some validation, et cetera. Um, and going through the GTR system is hard because there's a lot of parties involved. So you always got to be a community builder and a consensus builder. And that's hard. And some days that doesn't go well. And some days it does. For me, the one more round moment has always been, um, and I had mentors earlier on who said, never lose sight of your end consumer um, and the person who serves your product. And so I try as often as I can to get out and be in, in the wild. Uh, and for me, the one more round is when you find a person who more or less would have been the person in our minds when we designed the brand now some two years plus years ago. And that person is taken with it, frankly, without you prompting or, you know, overselling. Um, so we sponsored the Dallas Marathon. And I met lots of people. And I didn't even get to mention who the founder was a lot of the time. Uh, and they were asking me where to go buy it because, wow, this really tastes amazing. Uh, and that is so fulfilling uh, and sort of gets you back up to whatever you just got punched with thinking, okay, if I can do my job and get this brand in front of more of those folks, everything else will take care of itself. Uh, there is a long, hard game to be played in between me and that person. But if we keep doing the right thing and we stay persistent and we take the punches and get back up, um, we're doing the right thing. And I've and, and, and has been, I've been very fortunate to get those moments every now and then it's one of the beauties of the alcohol business is you can go out in a social environment and do pretty live testing. People are very happy to tell you if they don't like it. Um, but, uh, to get those moments every now and then to see that person, Hey, you're actually the person for whom we built this thing. Yeah. And they seem to like it, that there's nothing like it. There's no feeling like it in, in the world. And you know what? There's nothing like a damn beer after a run. Man, after <laughs> after a long run, I questioned myself why was I drinking whatever beer was at the the mini marathon finish line. And I was like, "Whoa, this is actually the most refreshing thing I've ever had." Uh, <laughs> I had two; it was great. Uh, so you know, you should, uh, if you really want publicity, not telling you what to do with your business, come to Kentucky with your next state and sponsor the mini marathon next year, uh, which happens the week before Derby, and then you can just be up here for Derby. Um, uh, pro tip, it. pro tip. So. Uh, Taylor, what about you? What's been your one more round experience? You know, you're, you've been in this for a while, you know, almost seven years now, like keep coming and, and since the inception idea and just keep coming back and, and bringing this to market. Yeah. No, I feel like I'm in the 59th round of that <laughs> um, <laughs> boxing match. Um, yeah. There, you know, for, for me, for me, like, you know, that's, it's, it's nice to open up those new accounts and it's nice to sort of like keep expanding. But, but what popped in my head when you asked that question was, you know, when people come to me and they tell me about the experience they had with it at home and like this one particular occasion, um, someone that I, I don't know that well, but um, he he came to me and said, I brought over the bottle of, of Salento and we, we sat around and had this really like great conversation with this family that had a loss and they were, were able to sort of like share their stories. And it meant to just be like a catalyst of like, here's the story of this tequila and, and, and then just talk small talk, but then it really like inspired like a deeper conversation. And there was some, some great healing from it and just real depth to the conversation. And so for me, that's, the ideal place is, is that like, like we're, we're used in a space of like growth and, or education. And you leave the, you leave that get together either inspired or, or educated. So, so hearing those stories make me want to keep fighting. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that makes a ton of sense. And Jake, last but not least, you know, what's your, what's been your one more round, like into this, into this world of, of, 
of whiskey? Yeah. You know, I think it's kind of even going back to what we were talking about a little bit ago with your fear and everything and just the idea of like, are you doing this right? If you are differentiating yourself. And I think that for us, it's that third party, that third party validation where, you know, you're, you're submitting your product into all these awards and all these competitions and everything. And, you know, you have no idea. And it's like, I chose a flavor profile, you know, for this bourbon that fit what my palate enjoyed. And, you know, we're all different and everybody has different, you know, subjective, uh, you know, terms to whatever they taste and everything too. And I think that when we submit and, you know, every year so far, we've, we've gotten gold or double gold, um, you know, with these, with each of the, um, competitions. So it's getting that third party validation by people that I have no idea who they are. And, um, you know, and they're, they're women, men, all various ages and everything. So it feels, you know, it's nice to have that where you're like, okay, like this is, this is really good quality. Um, and I think the other part, probably the, the next thing is, is the idea that we did want to focus on a, a you know, not your, um, stereotype, stereotypical customer. And then when we pull the data and we've got, you know, 65% of our customers are women, everybody's kind of like, how in the world are you getting so many women to drink bourbon? And it's just sort of like, I don't know, it all kind of comes together of like the idea of doing something differently and, and, you know, not just following the same playbook that other brands have done. You know, it sort of really stands out to you. Yeah, no, I I think that that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we all have inflection points, right? I think there's all going to be points and times in these brands that you all have crafted and created that you can be Sony or Blockbuster, or you can be Netflix, um, or you can be, you know, Apple and, and, you know, be the, the, the camera of the future, right. Versus, you know, being stuck on a Polaroid. Um, and so I think you all, all are in a very unique spot, um, to be nimble. Um, because the infrastructure is just different when you're, when you're building your brand versus, um, you know, having these multi-million dollar distilleries or brew houses or, um, you know, agave farms or any of those things, right? Like it's, it's just different. Um, so you know, I'm excited because you all are honest and open about what the fears are that you all have, but you also see that there's opportunity. And I think that's, that's what's really exciting to, to see you all, you know, talk about today. Um, as we kind of wrap up, we asked this last question to every one of our guests. Um, and it, and it goes something similar like this, you know, when you're not thinking about your business, and you're trying to enjoy life, what's your one piece of advice that you would give to us uh, to enjoy your off hours and the times that you're, you're not working? So Taylor, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, my piece of advice on enjoying off hours is, is really um, trying to be more present, trying to um, slow down, disconnect from your, your digital pieces and really sort of appreciate what you have right then and there. Mm, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Doug, what about you? Am I allowed to say enjoy a cold beer in your off hours? Yeah. No, I'm not. Um, I think, no, I very similar answer actually uh, as Taylor's. I mean, we like to, we talk a lot at our company. What are our, our values? Actually, we have eight, by, not by coincidence. Um, Shocker. Is to, is to find, exactly, is to find balance. But, um, we've had discussions about by fine balance, that doesn't mean you work hard and then you go, you know, blow off steam. It's being present and finding and being, you know, intensely present Mm -hmm. and going all in on whatever it is you're doing. If you're in the office with with us and you're working through stuff or we're in a bar together, you're all in. Yeah. Um, When you're off with your family, your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your, your dog, uh, all of us have dogs. Uh, do like do that and and be all in on that. That is actually real balance. Mm. Is finding the different things that fill you up and making sure that you're really wholeheartedly pursuing. No, uh, I think that's that's so true. Um, yeah. Sorry, I just made me start thinking about. I watched a TED talk yesterday on 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 how to be bored um, and not um, <laughs> do other things while you're intently doing something. Like, don't pick up your phone. Don't check your email. Yeah like be present in the moment. And actually that's, that's helpful for your brain. Your brain needs those moments to actually 
to flesh out true ideas. Um, we distract ourselves versus, versus allowing our, our brains to, to fully engage in the experiences that we're having. Highly recommend driving across Texas with no radio or podcast or anything else on for a little while. Yeah. It, for a little while. You'll have enough time to you'll have enough time to run through every podcast you have, by the way. It's a big thing. <laughs> but uh Well, there's there's uh there's ten episodes, about forty five minutes a piece of this one. So that'll get you a good chunk of Texas. Yep. <laughs> right. And then and then the other chunk that you have left, go in silence. <laughs> uh, yes, agreed. Uh so Lauren, uh last but not least, um, you know what what about you? You know, you're coming to a, a different state, a uh, different world, basically, like, even though, you know, same, same world, but different country. Um, you know, how do you enjoy, you know, this time when you're, you're trying to build so much a brand of, um, you know, get your footing here in the, in the United States, all those things. I think relaxation is different for everyone. Um, but universally, I think fresh air helps a- every individual get out, get into nature. I love hikes and I also love good food. So I would say sharing good food. Those are my comforts. Oh, amen. Amen to that. Me and Jake talk about food all the time. <laughs> I literally yeah, sent him a picture. Be the podcast, but the food didn't get brought up. <laughs> yeah, true. I literally sent him a picture of the cast iron skillet that I was getting ready to use to make, uh, um, sirloin steak tacos, uh, adobo tacos. They're really good. Way too spicy though. No one else ate them, but me, it was bad. I had 16 ounces of adobo steak. <laughs> I, I finally found someone to pawn it off on. I, I ate a good chunk of it, but you know, it was a lot of, a lot of meat. So great answers. Those are, those are awesome. So last but not least, this is the last question that I will give you all and it's self-promotion time. So, you know, can you, Lauren, share a little bit about where people can find out more about Melati drinks and, you know, what expansion looks like in the next year or so. Absolutely. So Melati drinks can be found on our website, melatidrinks.com. That's M-E-L-A-T-I drinks with an S dot com. We ship nationwide complimentary this year only um, as we come to the U.S. And we have a few exciting uh, things coming up, a few exciting collaborations with maybe some of the brands on this chat. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. That's that's called a tease. And so we'll see you next uh, uh, for season three with uh, Melati Drinks and what partnership she brought forward with the people on this phone call. Um, Taylor, what about you? Where, where can people find out more about Salento? Yeah, I'm not I'm not good at this part of the the sales the sales pitch, but um, yeah. Slentotequila.com is probably the easiest way to find it. Um, we're, we're, um, you know, in, in California, New York, Texas, Florida, and, um, internationally, Australia, Australia, South Africa, um, and expanding over there as well. But yeah, just go to Slentotequila.com. Got to go to the big surf places, right? Uh, there's always a coast of some sort. There you yeah. go. You, you got to find a way to enjoy yourself when you go visit those places. That's right. Yeah. There's all, uh, for me, the ocean is that sort of reset. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, definitely. Oh, that's awesome. Doug, I know, I know eight is only in the great state of Texas, um, but I'm sure that's it's correct. not going to be solely there forever. That's right. No, we're, we're always evaluating. Uh, you know, we try to let the consumer be our guide. So if we get inquiries from outside the state, well, I should say when we get enough inquiries, because we get a lot. Um <laughs> when we sort of feel there's a critical mass where we're, we're doing something for that reason and not for another, uh, we will, yeah, we'll seriously consider getting outside Texas. Um, and until then, if you go to eightbeer.com or drink eight beer on social media and you can find us, we have a little beer finder widget that will hopefully in a non creepy way, figure out where you are and tell you where the closest stores are uh, to pick it up. Will you all ship beer? Does that a thing? Um, we don't directly, but, the beautiful thing of having the distribution like we do in the grocery channel is H-E-B, Kroger, you know, all the specs, all the, the big chains have their own DDC business and frankly do it a lot better than we ever could by ourselves. Awesome. That's great. Jake, do you want to tell people where they can find out or should I just do my normal clothes? I think you can do the clothes. I like it. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening to this episode. Lauren, Doug, Taylor, we appreciate your time. As always, if you want to learn more about Off Hours, go over to at Drink Off Hours on all the social media platforms and you can learn about their lifestyle brands and you can also watch Jake make cocktails from time to time. Learned about that last time we chatted. 
if you want to know more about Bourbon Lens, you can go over to uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. And we'd appreciate it if you'd like, subscribe, and comment uh, on this podcast. What, what was your, what's your next round? What is you know your biggest fear? We'd like to know. Enjoy the conversation with you all. And until next time, cheers. <laughs>